Amen. I'm so glad you're here today. God is good. I'll do that one more time. God is good all the time. Amen. And He is good. And just in case you didn't think what I was saying earlier is, is, isn't in the Scripture for whatever reason that might be, Jesus is the one that declares in the final book of the New Testament, Behold, I make all things new. The prophet Isaiah, and Jesus confirms it, prophesies that he is Emmanuel, God with us. He is with us all the time, and he is good all the time. Let that revelation soak into our hearts. Kids can go to Kids Church, if you haven't already, the younger group, ages 4 through 2nd grade, out the door to the left. You'll find your teacher in the foyer. And the older group, third grade through 12 years old, out the door to the right. And we bless you as you go, kids. May the spirit of the living God rest upon you and be in you, filling you afresh and anew, empowering you to do great things. And that's for us too, amen? Praise God, today is Easter Sunday, also known as Resurrection Sunday. And uh, I, just, I, I just feel in the Spirit, it's been coming through the first two messages that I delivered last night and this, earlier this morning, this, this uh, refrain or this saying, resurrection, revelation. And, and I just shared that before, but I, I'm really believing that God is going to open the eyes of our hearts in a new way, in a fresh way, as we just go over some of His truth in His Word. His Word is powerful it's living. It's God-breathed. By it, we're sanctified. We're cleansed. We're washed clean. This is Resurrection Sunday, and Jesus, thank you for opening the eyes of our hearts, the ears of our hearts, that we could see, that we could hear, that the, our, hearts would just, the, the, our hearts would just expand and, and be open to the fullness of what you have for us and the revelation that you have for us in this. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to show you a picture. This is a picture of an empty tomb. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Some people, Protestants, evangelicals in particular, believe this is the very tomb that Jesus rose from. I'm not one of them. It could be. I, I just don't know for sure. The organization that maintains this tomb doesn't espouse that it is the actual tomb, but I show it to you for this reason, just to put a picture in our heads and in our minds and Holy Spirit willing in our hearts that the tomb is empty. Jesus did what no one else could do 2,000 years ago, and he continues to do it in spirit and in the natural. I did some research in preparation for this message, and I just want to tell you that I found out through deep research, and I'm being exaggerative, that the death rate in this region is 100%. There are those in the scripture that rose from the dead in the Old and New Testament, and they died a second time. There are a couple of examples of those that walked with God and were taken up in a chariot, Enoch and Elijah taken up in a chariot, so maybe they didn't see death, but... The death rate, as I've researched, is 100%. Jesus has something different to say about that and what death actually means. He brings life and newness where there just seems to be none. And that's a word. That's a word that goes deep into many of our hearts that are listening, online and present. Some of us are dealing with some deep stuff. It's hard. We're dealing with physical illnesses. We're dealing with relationship problems and disasters. We're dealing with deep hurt and deep pain. The Word of God says that, therefore, if we are in Christ, we are made new. Now all things are of God. We may not get what we determine to be the definition of newness. God, do this for me. God, make this happen. Would you please intervene here? But we do get what he defines as newness. And because he is the one that resurrected, because he is perfect, and because he sees everything, and he's good all the time, he has the right to define what we need, and I'm so grateful for that. So many times he's given me what I need and what I didn't want. And in retrospect, I can see that it's a blessing. 
I want to take us to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to read from verses 13 to 20. And this is Paul talking to the church that is at Corinth. This is his first letter to them, and they're divided. And there's some things that have crept in, some doctrinal heresies that have started to creep into the church. And one of them is the resurrection never happened. And Paul responds to it this way. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and our faith is also empty. There's nothing to what we believe if he didn't rise from the dead, is what he's saying. He goes on, yes, and we who are found false, we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up, if, in fact, the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, he's saying it again in verse 16, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then also, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. No hope of seeing them again. If there's no resurrection, if there's no history changing, eternal changing, resurrection of Jesus Christ. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits, first fruits of those of us who believe and follow him. We're following in our Savior's example and in his lead and in his guidance. First fruits of those who have fallen asleep. You and I will fall asleep one day. And when we do, if we believe in Christ, we have everything to look forward to. Paul is drawing attention to the empty tomb. This is the preeminent thought in his epistle to 1 Corinthians. He wants unity. He wants love. When, he, when he's talking to this church in Corinth, he's te- speaking to them about communion, but he's saying it's all founded on the proof that Jesus rose from the dead. He says this phrase, if in this life only we are of if, if in this life only, um, I, for, I, I, I said it wrong. I quoted it wrong. I'll get it for you. If, if in this life only we have hope in Christ. There it is. Sorry about that. If, we are, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Before I go to that next slide, I want to just share this. All of the apostles in the original scripture All of the authors of Scripture, and some of them didn't author Scripture, all of them are attested as being martyred, as being killed. Some of them were crucified. Some of them were stabbed. Bartholomew was flayed open alive, according to history. Graphic, brutal, but true. Some things that happened. No one, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. They were living a life that was pitiable. They were laying down their lives. If there's no resurrection, what Paul's saying is they were living and dying for a lie. You and I, it doesn't take too much head and thought and knowledge to understand that if someone is dying for a lie, it's a very rare occasion. Not only dying for a lie, but dying in defense of a lie. They were dying because they believed in Jesus. When we go to work, when we have our family things that go on and all the things that we go, on, go through in life, the different trials, the challenges, the different problems we face, are we really operating in a revelation of Jesus ri- risen from the dead? Or are we succumbing to unforgiveness and bitterness? Are we succumbing to fear? Are we succumbing to anxiety and different things that are wrapped up in a lack of revelation of his resurrection? I, for one, have suffered with that. I've dealt with that. And Jesus continues by his grace to remind me, despite my stumbles, despite my problems, that he rose from the dead and he has victory. And it's calling us to a place of repentance and turning to him. 
the other thing he's saying is that if we in this life only have hope in Christ, being pitiable, there in verse 19, the other thing he's saying is that there's such an exclusivity with Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. There's no other, it's, it's exclusive. There's no other way that this can be described. And sometimes that lands us in trouble. Muslims are exclusive as well. Here's just a couple verses from the Quran. But unlike Muslims, we don't have a right to retaliate. According to the Quran in Surah 4, for instance, it says, we shall cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve, the infidels. They're told in their scripture that they can retaliate. What are we told? If someone slaps you on the right side of the cheek, turn to him, the other also. We, we are of all men, Paul says, the most pitiable. Yes, there's other religions that have an exclusive focus on deity, but none like Christianity. Chapter 9, Surah 9 of the Koran. Then kill the disbelievers wherever you find them, capture them and besiege them, and lie in wait for them in each and even in every ambush. I'm not going to sh- ask for a show of hands of how many people have had those thoughts. Maybe not it's a whole pe- maybe it's not the whole people group, but maybe it's a spouse, or maybe it's a son, or maybe it's a mom, or maybe it's a friend, someone that's really gotten under your skin. This past week, Becky and I found out from Verizon has been really good to us. We made a deal with them that we would get a free phone, and we <laughs> it was. Very clear, twice we verified it. And as we're calling them, we're fine. We were paying for this phone. We were supposed to get a new phone. And we go right up the chain, and they keep saying, there's nothing we can do. You were incorrect in your understanding. I said, no. <laughs> go back and look at the audio footage. Listen to it. And see what, we, what was said. They wouldn't budge. It was an opportunity more for Becky than me. She was on the phone a lot longer than I was. To turn the other cheek, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Jews are also those. Where am I going today? That's what I get for preaching three times this weekend. Jews are also an exclusive religion. They believe in Yahweh, right? They put their trust in Yahweh. Jesus reminds the Jews in his great sermon, Matthew chapter 5 and 38, you have heard that it was said, Jews, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I'm telling you to turn the other cheek. I'm telling you that if your brother wants to sue you and take away your garment, give him your cloak also. He might be saying it to some of us American Christians, and we should be Christian Americans. (laughs) If you take my meaning. If, if, if someone wants you to go one mile, go with him too. And Jesus is saying, this is how I live, and this is how I want you to live, and I'm going to prove it in a short time when I raise from the dead and show you that there's a revelation yet to be had, a revelation of what I want to do on the earth. In verse 43 of his great sermon in chapter 5, he says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who spitefully use you. And say all kinds of evil things against you. We are of all men the most pitiable when we claim the resurrection and the extent of the love that's represented in the resurrection. I want to take a minute as the Lord leads. Holy Spirit... Let this be more than words in our minds, understanding and our physical reasoning. Knowledge puffs up. Let this be you touching our hearts and enlightening our hearts, shining your light deep in us, giving your grace that enables us to live day in and day out with the revelation of your resurrection. In Jesus' name. 
in Jesus' name. Let me show you one more from that passage I read earlier. He says this, then your preaching is em- our preaching is empty. If there's no resurrection, our preaching is empty. And your faith is also empty. Your faith is futile, produces nothing if there's no resurrection. You're still in your sins if there's no defeat of death and the grave and sins. If there's no resurrection, there's no distinguishing mark, not really, not, not in power, not in eternal transcendence. There's no distinguishing mark between us and other religions. Let me just give you a couple of quotes. First one is from Gautama Buddha. And Buddhists under Gautama Buddha believe this. This is a quote from him, their leader, their founder. Long is the cycle of birth, birth and death to the fool who does not know the true path. He's claiming a true path. And those of us that know even a little bit about Buddhism, we know that they have eight noble truths that you have to work and earn and try to achieve so that you can reach nirvana, the state of peace, as defined by Buddhism. You know what I'm going to say. Buddha is in the grave. Unless Jesus rose from the dead, many people could just as equally go down this route than the other because there would no, there'd be no answer for sin and we would have no proof in our hearts that he is alive today and that he makes a difference in every situation in this world in so many ways that we do not see. I'm going to call atheism a religion. Christopher Hitchens says this next, next quote. He's a famous Uh, atheist who has passed away. He was asked, do you fear death? And he responded this way, do I fear death? No. I am not afraid of being dead because there is nothing to be afraid of. I won't know it. Christopher Hitchens is in the grave still. Many people we know, maybe there's people here, there's, there's just... This is an atmosphere of the Spirit of the Lord, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's no condemnation to those who are in the Spirit. But Jesus says, you'll hear the truth by the preaching of the Word, and the truth will make you free, and free indeed. Some of us here might have ascribed to this type of thinking, or whatever wind of doctrine or thought or philosophy that we find online, Instagram or wherever, And it can catch our our minds and actually catch our hearts without us knowing. We need to be anchored in the revelation of the resurrection. It transcends everything. It's the power of God. It's the gospel message, the power of God to save and deliver and free us. It shakes off all those other things that compete with the truth. When Jesus says these words, Jesus saying, I am the resurrection and the life. He's talking to Martha on the verge of raising Lazarus from the dead a few weeks before he is risen from the dead. He's demonstrating in the natural that this man, four days in the grave, who his sister says smells, we don't want to open the tomb, but Jesus commands him to open the tomb. He's demonstrating that he has power. He's not only defeated death, but he's the author of resurrection. That's why hope does not disappoint when it's in Jesus, when we put our trust in him. He says to Martha, do you believe this? And it's not him saying, do you believe that I exist? It's not him saying, do you believe that I'm a real person? Like many of us can do. So we can all say those things. Yes, we do. It's the word pistuo, which goes beyond knowing that he's a real person. It means I'm putting my complete trust, my whole being, all that I know about myself into all that I know about him, which isn't too much, but I know that he's good. I know that he rose from the dead, and I know that he's going to make my heart new and new again. If you agree with that, just give me an amen. Amen. Praise God. This is a picture of Jeff Markin and Dr. Clance. Uh, Chauncey Crandall, a cardiologist. 
Jeff Markin was living a life that wasn't in God. And he had some things he was dealing with. He had some guilt he was dealing with. And this is his quote. I was going through a midlife crisis. Separation from my family was the biggest regret I had. This is before he met Jesus. So he's talking about it in the past tense. Here's how he met Jesus. He's on his way to work, a workaholic, working day in and day out. He's on his way to work, and he starts having the symptoms of a heart attack. He barely makes it to the hospital. As he's pulling out his wallet to produce his identification cards, he falls over, completely faints, is out of it, right in the waiting room. The personnel call into the ER. They get him, they get all the personnel together. They get him into the ER, and they call over the loudspeaker, Dr. Crandall, we need you. Dr. Crandall shows up on the scene, and for 40 minutes, they're trying to take this man, revive this man who has flatlined. 12 times, and at least 12 rounds of uh, AED defibrillator shocking him and CPR in between. And after 40 minutes, Dr. Crandall calls the death, calls the time of death. He writes his note, he puts it in the file, and on his way out of the door of the ER, the Holy Spirit speaks to him and says to him, I want you to go back and pray for that man. Now, you may not believe what I'm about to tell you, but I can tell you this. I called the hospital where Dr. Crandall did this, and they verified that he's there. They didn't verify the story, but they verified he's there because they didn't have time for me because I was some guy from New York just calling for social purposes. (laughs) You can see it online, and and, and, and there's, there's a lot of attestation behind it. He goes back in, he puts his hands on Jeff Markin's chest, and he says these words in front of the nurse who is objecting to Dr. Crandall being there, in front of the other physician who's also present. Father God, he says, I cry out for this man's soul. If he does not know you as his Lord and Savior, Father, raise him from the dead now. In Jesus' name, he turns to the other physician. He says, shock him again. The physician says, are you kidding me? Look, for me, I'm calling a favor. Please shock him again. Out of a favor and courtesy and respect for Dr. Crandall, he does. They shock him and he comes back to life. Within a few days, he has no brain damage. He's normal. This is Dr. Chauncey Crandall who lost his son Chadwick a short time before to leukemia and prayed for God to minister to him. You're not hearing me preach that Jesus resurrects and heals everything that we direct our gaze to. We need to stay humble before him, before the revelation of his resurrection. Let that sweep into our hearts. We need to stay humble before him and reverent, expecting him to do good things and praying with faith and expectation. But sometimes he's chastening Sometimes he's doing something that's beyond us and we need to stay humble. Love each other, weep with each other when we're weeping. But God's still doing amazing things. It's the testimony of Jesus that is the spirit of prophecy. Toward the end of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says these words, borrowing from the prophet Hosea. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. Death has a sting. Theologians describe it as fear. And it's fear that's rooted in guilt. Because there's a knowing among all mankind because of the universal work and conviction of the Holy Spirit that we've done wrong, that we've crossed the line that we've committed sin. It's sometimes like an alarm clock that just keeps throbbing guilt, 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 and it it just doesn't, it never shuts off. Some of us are dealing with that. I'm not saying everybody, but some of us here, and I'm just saying this is a safe place Not because I'm here, not because anybody else is here, but because God is here and we let him move the way he wants to. This is a safe place to relief, for for relief of your guilt, to release the bitternesses 
to release forgiveness, to let him come in. And there's many times that we feel like we have a right to hold on to the wounds in our hearts. My dad hurt me. My mom crushed my heart. This person did me wrong. It can be anybody, violations and hurts and wounds, and we think we have a right to hold on to that wound. It's justifiable. But even in a more compassionate tone of the Holy Spirit, I want to say this. There's times that the wound is so deep, we can't even see how to escape it. Because it went so deep, it cut us right to the core. Our hearts are hemorrhaging, and we have to put bandage on it. We have no, it's, it's, the, it's the deception of the enemy. It's the trick of the enemy to think that we can guard our hearts by ourselves. The word of God, the God-breathed word says that it's he who guards our hearts and it's he who heals our hearts. It starts with repentance in his loving presence and letting the depth of his love wash over our hearts with waves and billows of affection and mercy and hope and peace truth that sets us free. You don't have to leave here today staying guilty. None of us do. It's because of love that Jesus rose from the dead. The love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins or the reparation for our sins, the salve that takes care of that wound and makes it new. This is a picture of Pastor Daniel Akachukwu and his wife, Nanika. Pastor Daniel and his wife were leading a ministry, and he's a respected man. One night, Him and his wife get into a discussion, and it's not a very nice discussion. And she ends up slapping him across the face. Pastor Daniel, in his dignity, in his pride, takes an offense. Should she have slapped him? No, I'm not saying that. But he takes up an offense, and he goes to bed angry, contrary to what Paul tells us to do. Don't go to bed angry, Ephesians 4.26. He goes to bed angry. The next morning, he has to go to minister. His wife comes to him in contrition. She's, she's feeling sorry for what she's done. She asks for forgiveness, and he ignores her. He goes out the door and leaves for the day. In route to where he's going to be ministering, he has a very serious car accident that leaves him with terminal damages. He's taken to the hospital, the first hospital. It's actually a clinic, not a hospital. There his wife is notified, and she begs him, go to the next hospital where your physician is. He says, I might not live. I want, to go, I want you to go there. I'm going to meet you there. He goes there. She meets him there, and he's telling her that I'm going to die. And she says these words to him. You're a man of God and should have faith and be speaking and not be speaking of dying. Sometimes when my wife gives me that type of encouragement, it's not well received. Maybe if I was on death's door, it would be well received. And I've had occasion to give her that type of encouragement. It's good to stay humble. I shouldn't have said that, Becky. I shouldn't have said that, Josh. I shouldn't have said that, brother. I shouldn't have said that, sister. She gives him this exhortation. He passes away. The doctor, the the medical personnel on, on site verify he's dead. She will not accept that answer. She takes him to another clinic, and the physician pronounces him dead on the spot. She is devastated. They end up taking him to a family, a gentleman they know that's a mortician, and the mortician begins to prepare his body for the grave. He injects embalming fluid into his hands. He injects embalming fluid into his feet. He cuts a slit in his thigh and is about to start an injection into his femoral artery with embalming fluid. 
And as soon as he does, he receives a shock. He doesn't think anything of the shock, though, because this is Africa where the cultic and satanic practices are very real. Sometimes the Africans wonder about us being over there <laughs> last November and just, just knowing how some of the ways they, the, the reality they live in. They're like, Why don't Americans believe this stuff? It's real. Yeah, it is. Demons are real, and they move in different ways. Maybe the demon of this age, the God of this age, has blinded our eyes, and we should awake out of sleep. Arise from the dead. Arise from the stupor. He tries again because this is his job. I'm going to inject this patient because I want to prepare him for the grave, and he gets a shock again, and this is going beyond anything he's experienced in a cultic uh, past. He goes and tells the family, I can't do it. The next morning, rigor mortis has by now far set in. The next morning, now two days after Daniel passed away, the next morning, Nanika takes him to a conference where Reinhard Bonnke is speaking, the famous evangelist. I'm going to skip right to it. Reinhard has nothing to do with this testimony. She takes him there because she believes Jesus wants to heal him. Reinhard finishes his speech. It's some kind of inaugural address for the for the church. He finishes his speech, leaves the conference. The pastor's son sees that Nanika is making such a fuss. He takes her to to the basement along with a few others, and they begin praying for him, and he rises from the dead. This is another story of resurrection that is confirmed by medical professionals. He rises from the dead, and his family attests to this day that for at least a week, he smelled like embalming fluid. It was oozing out of his pores. But here's where I want to take us. I want to bring us to this revelation of the resurrection more and more as I'm just closing up here. He goes in his time where he was out, those 42 hours, He's taken with an angel to see some pretty amazing things. He goes to heaven and sees heaven, as he describes. And then he goes to hell and sees the horror of hell. And he indicates to the angel, gee, I'm glad I'm not going there. This is Pastor Daniel testifying of his own mouth. And the angel turned to me and said, oh, but if you were called to task today, this is where you would go. He responds to the angel. He says, I am a man of God. I serve him with all my heart. And the angel says to him, according to Pastor Daniel's testimony, the angel says to him, have you forgiven your wife? Have you forgiven? Daniel (laughs) acknowledges, I had not forgiven my wife. Jesus says, if you forgive, you'll be forgiven. If you forgive men their trespasses and other humans their trespasses, you'll be forgiven. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your sins, your trespasses be forgiven. Part of the revelation of the resurrection is realizing how deep and enveloping and encompassing the power of Jesus wants to be in our lives. He wants it all. So when Pastor Daniel says, I worship you with all my heart, he's confronted with a life-saving revelation of this angel telling him, no, you're not serving me with all your heart. I don't want to scare you. John says that he's told, he's describing his encounter with Jesus, literally being in the presence of, in the throne room of our holy God. He's told, do not be afraid. This is God speaking. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of Hades and of death. Whether or not you believe it, and whether or not you have the best understanding in the room of what the enemy is after. The enemy is called the God of this age. He's called the Prince of the Air, and he blinds our eyes, and he takes our eyes and our minds and distracts us from what really matters. 
Paul is staking his life, his life, his physical life, on what he's telling the church in Corinth. Without the resurrection, there's nothing. This is everything. I want to quote verse 25 and 26. I paraphrased it earlier, but the words of Jesus to Martha and through the inspired scripture, us too, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? You don't have to answer out loud. There's many people listening online. You don't have to, I can't hear you. But you have to have a certainty from Jesus and the Holy Spirit that you trust him. He gives that assurance. You trust that it's only in Jesus that I can be saved, not only in this life, but for eternity. You trust and you believe that the God, Yahweh, God the Father, the Father of Jesus, is holy and perfect. You trust what Jesus says about me and you. You're a sinner, Josh. You're guilty apart from me, and there's nothing you can do to make that better apart from me, just choosing me. You trust in what the Scripture describes as the urgency of eternity. There's an eternal life at stake. As you stand to your feet, I'm going to give you one more example. This is Dr. Sean George, a physician. His wife, Sherry, is also a physician. He is experiencing a heart attack. He's only 39 years old at the time. And the doctors, his colleagues, are telling him, you're having a heart attack. One of them denies it at first, but then they finally say, you're having a heart attack. Finally, Sean comes around. He calls his wife. She's rushing to the hospital. He passes away before she can get there. They're doing CPR for 55 minutes. That's longer than any, anything will happen. Any, any, any ER will do that. They're doing it because Sherry says, keep going. I'll be there. Please keep going until I get there. She gets there and she says these words in front of the physician team. One of them's a Hindu. Lord, Sean is only 39 years old. I'm only 38. We only have a 10-year-old boy. I need a miracle. I've said some holy, more holy prayers in my estimation than that. Humble. <laughs> Humble. He rises from the dead. Not only does he rise from the dead, within three days he's reading his own chart and he returns to full function as a professional physician. There are many people, probably principally my father-in-law, when he passed away, there are many people I begged God, I prayed over them, their, their bodies no life in them, praying over God, come back to life. In the name of Jesus, rise, rise, rise. And I was not, it was not to be. The answer for me in those situations is not to say, oh, must be God doesn't exist. Must be he hates me. Must be I've done something wrong. Maybe, maybe but not to the point of condemnation if we're in Christ. My point in saying this is that we don't always get what we expect in our minds, but there's something about unifying as a body in the resurrection revelation. When we unite as a body, we each get a picture. We each do a part. We each have an individual role to play. That's what the lead up to 1 Corinthians 15 is describing. We are one body in Christ where I fail as a pastor, no matter what my title is, where I fail as a pastor, I need my brothers and sisters to see in a different way. Where you fail as an individual, you need brothers and sisters to get your back. And God has designed the revelation of his resurrection to work in various ways in each of us, and each of us doing our part. I want us to take communion in closing. Jerry, if you'd come and just play.
if the worship team wants to come. Katie. Katie. Yes, thank you, Katie. It was dear last service. That You'll have that when you have multiple services in a weekend. Paul ends his chapter in 15 of 1 Corinthians. He says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to invite you to sit or get on your knees instead of stand. If you can, that's okay. There is something so, so deep that Paul is getting at in this letter. Jesus is the light. And he says to walk in the light as he is in the light. John writes, in him is life, and that life is the light of men. The word of God says that the light of God exposes things that should be exposed. For that which makes manifest is light. That which exposes is light. It's the light of God. It's the light of Jesus. Right after that, in Ephesians 5, he says, Awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you life. He says, See then that you walk circumspectly, That means walk with vigilance, not with assumption, not with callousness, not with cockiness. When John wrote those words in Revelation, he was prostrate before the Lord. And the Lord told him, do not be afraid. And I just... I just want to encourage you. I'm going to I'm going to go I'm going to lay down here. I'm going to get low because I want to encourage you to get low in his presence. If you have to go, you can go, but There's something about saying enough is enough with living with a lack of revelation of who Jesus is and what he did for me. There's something about just, I'm going to give everything to God. And when John is prostrate before him, he's in the revelation of who God is. He's seeing the resurrection, resurrected Christ. Paul says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, too long, brothers and sisters. I have gone on. It's it's part of the beauty of digging into the scripture. He opens it up and it becomes a living, powerful revelation and it starts to divide soul and spirit. Too long I have been duplicitous in ways that I didn't realize, leaning on the flesh and not living in the Spirit. Not as fools, but as wise. It's part of awakening. He's talking about this in Ephesians 5. Redeeming the time, knowing that the days are evil. Oh God, that the eyes of our hearts, my heart, would be enlightened, that I would know what are the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints. 
in what is the exceeding greatness of your power toward those who believe. I'm just going to be honest. I sense in the Spirit that some of us were about to take communion. I'm not judging in the, in the sense of condemnation. I'm just following what the Spirit's... Some of us were about to take communion in an irreverent, in an unworthy way, knowing that there's sins in our lives and we haven't repented of. And Paul says, for this reason, many die prematurely. Many go to sleep. Because they come to the table of the Lord irreverently and not knowing what God, not not yielding to God's word, not yielding to what he's convicting them of. Paul says, when we take communion, to examine ourselves. It's saying, Holy Spirit, search me now and see if there's any wicked way in me. Shine the light in my heart, into the deep recesses of my heart, wherever you want to shine it. Reveal any darkness. And then at saints of God, it's, it's a choice. It's a choice. It's, if you're here and you're not a saint of God, if you're not a believer, it's still a choice. It's to realize that he's there with open arms. He's never left you. And he's, he's just wanting you to say yes to him. Create in me a new heart. Renew a right spirit within me, a steadfast spirit that does not go to and fro, that does not constantly backslide and misstep. Do not cast me away from your presence. Restore unto me the joy of salvation. Some of us, it might be for the first time, the joy of salvation. I'm just going to invite us to take communion, each of us individually, when you're ready. When you're ready. There's a union in communion, but it doesn't mean that we have to do it in sync. When you're ready, when you know that you've done business with the Lord, what Paul's saying in 1 Corinthians 11 is that there's some of us that have illnesses and diseases, and it's a manifestation of God's grace. It's not a disease or an illness from him, but he's allowing it to happen to demonstrate that our hearts aren't ready. Some of us have been praying for physical things to break, and Jesus wants to break them. But he is so merciful and he's so gracious. He loves us so much that he's chastening our hearts and he will not let us escape. There's someone we need to forgive. There's an addiction and a propensity to look places we shouldn't look and to do certain things that we shouldn't do. And we know it. Guilt is often accompanied with a sense of heaviness. Some of us are feeling the heaviness in this season, and it's been a long season. And he's wanting to take that heaviness if we let his light shine in our hearts and we just begin to repent. And he replaces that heaviness with his easy yoke. I was praying for a lady recently who had trouble forgiving her mom. And she was having these symptoms of back pain. She was walking around with slumped shoulders. She had a very tangible, tangible heaviness. And just releasing that and telling the Lord to have his way and in repenting and just forgiving her, mo- her mom, the heaviness was lifted. She opened her eyes and she had a smile and she said, I'm light. It feels so light. It feels so good.
Let God do it. Let God speak to your heart. If you've got to go somewhere, you can. And as Katie plays, there's room here and there's time here to wait on the Lord. Wait for that revelation to come. Let the tears flow. Let his holy touch, his newness, minister to your heart. I'm going to give you one more, and I'll give you more if the Holy Spirit leads because I do not want to quench him, but I'm going to give you one more. Some of us have been burnt by church in a bad way. We've seen it. We've done it. Our loved ones have been hurt. We've been hurt. We've... (laughs) I hope you understand that I'm saying this humbly, but some of us are, in a sense, CEOs, Christmas, Easter only. And we come to church on Christmas and Easter only. And we've gotten into a place where that's, that's okay. And I'm not, I'm not hawking ACF. I'm really not. You, go to, you need to be in a church. You need to be in a fellowship with brothers and sisters. But he is shaking that which can be shaken. He's speaking and he's convicting it just happens to be using my mouth, I, I hope, I trust, in a way that's scriptural, but a way that's powerful, the preaching of the word that leads to freedom and deliverance. He's speaking to some things. You've been hurt, you've been burnt, you've reduced yourself to coming on occasion to church, and this just happens to be an occasion where he's saying, will you let me change everything? Will you let me heal the hurt? Will you let me heal the ways that I did not want people to hurt you, but they did? Will you let me be your healer? It starts with you being on your knees, in the heart, in the spirit, maybe literally, and repenting. I'm done trusting in my own way. I'm done making my own life. I'm done calling all the shots. I'm done with the steering wheel. Holy Spirit, I'm going to let you lead me and guide me into your way everlasting in the way that I should go. As Katie sings, I want to invite you, if you haven't already, to take communion when you're ready and to stay in his presence. There's a lot more than I can capture with my words that he wants to do if we would only wait on him.